from the new recording lair located deep beneath the Wine and Spirit Store in Ephrata, Pennsylvania. You're listening to the Masonic Light Podcast. Studio 665 presents Masonic Light Podcast. This show is recorded by Masons, for Masons, and is for entertainment purposes only. And please, no wagering. This podcast is not endorsed by any Grand Lodge, and the ridiculous ramblings of the hunks are their own. And now, here's your host. Good evening, everybody. Hey, now. Good Welcome. Good evening. Masonic Light Podcast, episode 140. What? Do it. <laughs> <laughs> 140. 140. 140. Yeah. Oh, yeah, there it is. 140. Yeah, we're still here. Holy. Ta da. Seth, so, did you ever think we would get to 140? I didn't know Larry could count to 140. <laughs> <laughs> it was shocking. <laughs> so, Seth, you were on what, episode one? Or? Well, well, it was like two or three, I think, yeah. Oh, okay, you're you're a retread, so we're glad to have you. I am the guest of last resort. <laughs> <laughs> but you are, you brought a special guest with you today, the illustrious potentate of Zembo Shrine, Ta-da. Mike Smith. Welcome. Thanks for having me, guys. I'm definitely special, but... Maybe, maybe not in the ways you, you're alluding to. Mike, so, uh, Mike, just a reminder, this is a radio show, so you have to talk. You can't just look. <laughs> <laughs> Thank so, you for the uh, reminder. So what we do here, um, we're going to go around a table. Uh, if Tim already has his calendar up, we're going to start with Tim today. Oh, okay. Um, and we're going to see what we've been up to for the past two weeks. And if Tim doesn't bore us too much, we'll keep going. <laughs> So, Timmy, what have uh, you been up to? So, since we last recorded uh, Harrisburg Lodge of Perfection, actually all of the bodies in the Harrisburg Scottish Rite um, held Harrisburg their... Harrisburg LOP. LOP, yeah. Best line going, right? That's oh, what I've heard. God. That's what I've heard, too. Um, and no one here <laughs> to contradict that tonight. No, the Big Valley. Um, anyway, we had our election of officers. Uh, all went well. Um both Mike and I moved up in the line of uh, the Lodge of Perfection. Uh, Capital Area Scottish Rite Club met the next evening. Um, let's see, what else? Um, lots of play practices um, <laughs> in the run-up to the uh, reunion, which was fantastic. Um, had a good class. Had a, Everything went off swimmingly. Do, yes. you, do you know we have... People all over the world talking about play practice. I know it. <laughs> <laughs> you started a trend, Larry. Yes, I did. Um, yeah, so those are the big things uh, that are going on, uh, that have been going on. We did have a uh, Eureka West Shore Lodge number 302 held its monthly toast call, uh, as it usually does on the third Wednesday. And it followed the District 3 Past Masters Dinner, which was pretty cool because we just put chairs and stuff up in the parking lot at the Carlisle Masonic Center. And we had 10 or 15 guys there. And we were joined by Right Worshipful Grandmaster Jeff Wonderling, which was great. Um, that was a special treat for us. Were you drinking in solo cups and paper bags? Like and, uh, you should? We were drinking in whiskey per- rails. Okay. Um, per the digested decisions, per the it has digested to be in a decisions. paper bag. <laughs> yeah, right. No, this was outside of the lodge, so and then, you know we all bought our own and brought our own cigars, and so uh, anyway, that was the big thing. Uh, Sunday, following the reunion, had a great uh, after party uh, with a Steely Dan band uh, tribute band. Uh, wow. It was well attended. It's really appropriate because Steely Dan has a song called The Fez, but I don't yes. think we can talk about what it means. Exactly. Um, but anyway, so that's pretty much what I've been up to. That sounds the like the most Caucasian weeks. afternoon I've heard in years. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> a Steely Band tribute band. Yeah. Wow. <laughs> Jack, what have you been up to? Not as much as Tim. No, <laughs> definitely not, he said with a smile. No, I just, you know, regular stuff. I am. Um, <laughs> um, doing my uh, mentoring classes with the with the new candidates and just you know, that's what I do. That's what I do. And uh, Grotto, we had Grotto Sunday night. And uh, how were the mushrooms? 
The mu- actually, I heard the food. The food was the really food good. The food was ridiculous. Uh, it was really good. John Wright's Restaurant in Wrightsville, PA. Not a sponsor. Uh, not a sponsor yet. Yet. Um, <laughs> but, um, yeah, the, the – poor – Poor Jay Laser, monarch of Ubar Grotto. God love him. He had this. He so far, so far, he's had five meetings, and four of his guests have canceled on him <laughs> at the last minute. It's like, like, I, I want to have a pin made with Charlie Brown and Lucy and the football, you know? And it's just, it's just like that. It's God. Um, so the idea was, you know, um, Pennsylvania mushrooms. That was he was going to have a speaker. And the whole meal was mushrooms, and it was phenomenal. I mean, the the, the dinner was was great. Um, the the presentation, not so much. But uh, it was a video that would have originally been shared on the PCN cable it, network, PCN network, which is like cable access for the state of Pennsylvania. Um, but but it was it was done like this with the speakers on the PC. And well, no, the speaker nobody the, could hear what right, was being said. Right, the speaker said. was a laptop. <laughs> speaker <laughs> and it was a big room meanwhile god bless jay <laughs> my family was one of the original families in the mushroom business in Kenneth square starting in 1956 <laughs> my grandfather started mushroom transportation company which i don't know who owns that now but if you see all orange trailers that is no longer mushroom but like yeah so i'm watching his speaker fail and I'm sitting here. I'm like, this is my moment to step in. Like, I've, I know all this stuff. I started working in the mushroom houses at 13 years old, and then he starts playing this video, and it's a snoozer. And finally, I'm just like, I'm going to go to the bar. I'm like, you know what? I'm halfway to my car. <laughs> Uh, Instead of being a negative Nancy, I decided to take my negative Nancy outside and not contaminate anyone. Uh, Seth, what have you been up to the past couple weeks? Uh, t- uh, there's always too much Masonic things in my world to, to deal with, but uh, I'll just give a shout-out to two good friends, uh, Mark Mattern and Harry Smith. Our Grand Commandery just met last weekend, and uh, Mark finished a great term as right eminent Grand Commander and won a contested election to be Grand Recorder. I didn't, you know, you don't hear about secretaries in contested elections wow. very often, but, wow. but Mark won a contested election. To I be think there might be one coming up somewhere on in well, the Harrisburg area. What was story. he thinking? Uh, uh, so <laughs> congratulations to Mark on winning that. And then Harry Smith becoming right eminent grand commander immediately following him. I know Harry's going to have a great year. And the, <laughs> I think the biggest accomplishment is if you notice pictures of the grand commander in Pennsylvania, they stopped wearing chapeaus and they have fatigue hats they can wear now. So uh, my God, what a change. No big feathered hat. So kudos to yeah, Harry. I saw and Harry Mark. with uh, with scrambled eggs on his visor. Yeah, right. Like not not a big chapeau, and that's a legal hat now. So it was, <laughs> it was a big session. And you can wear skull and crossbones aprons in Commandery. Woo! Get those esoteric guys out. It's going to be a good time. I understand there was an excellent snack had um, a gift to all the attendees. There the was. Night. My wife actually loved that snack yeah. a lot. In- Intermezzo by Stephanie had Ta-da. some. Uh, some very good chocolates at the table, and oh, yeah. we were glad to have it. Were they MVC. shaped like skull and crossbones? No, we couldn't get that done. We just had candy bars with it Mark's, was a wrapper. Mark's wrapper. Yes. Uh, there was an extra seat at the table, which she immediately scarfed the chocolate. <laughs> <laughs> Smart girl. Well, well played, sir. Well played. <laughs> so, Mr. Mike, potentate, and you're in the... the the uh, Lodge of Perfection line. What else have you been up to the past couple of weeks? Well, uh, following Seth around. <laughs> <laughs> it's a full-time job. It yeah. is. It takes yeah. a village. Um, <laughs> <laughs> well, we, we've uh, – I, I have been living and breathing Zembo for the last six months, and uh, my wife Lauren and I have been traveling all over the, the mid-Atlantic to various shrine centers. So we've had a great time, and – uh, we've also, you know, all joking aside, uh, our, my partner in crime here, our Oriental guide at Zembo, Seth, has finished his term as Royal Grand Patron of the Grand uh, Court of Amaranth. Did I say that correctly? Yeah, it's close enough. Close enough. <laughs> Thank you. You're not going to hold it against me. So uh, I think he's pretty excited to have that term done. But uh, Sounds like a laugh a minute. It it, it was exciting. It, it, it was a good time. Good time was had by all, as they'd say. In so, uh, however, Stacy Stacy was uh, elected as associate grand 
Help me out here. Oh, I thought you were going to get it. it so Condu- <laughs> conductress. <laughs> conductress. You were so close. I, 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 uh, I admittedly, and I'm going to embarrass myself. I, uh, the, the, You're going to embarrass yourself anyway. Well, You're this is true. This is true. Um, I know the, the uh, offices are very similar to, uh, to Eastern Star. So. So, so, Mike, you mentioned traveling the Mid-Atlantic, but why are you traveling the Mid-Atlantic? Uh, well, I, uh, I'm traveling the Mid-Atlantic, uh, well, one, one uh, to, to meet other Shriners, my counterparts. Yeah, yeah, that's nice. Why are you traveling? He's but, supporting uh, local gasoline companies. Right. <laughs> that's true. And, you know, driving a Chevy Suburban, it's easy to support. Oh! It's easy to support big oil. Yeah. So, uh, <laughs> no, we... Uh, I'm going to support big battery. That's exactly. What I'm so, I am, uh, I'm a candidate for third vice president of the Mid-Atlantic Shrine Association, which is... 24 shrine centers in the actually 23 in the mid-atlantic and one in germany so is that a paying uh, gig it is not a paying gig it's on my dime (laughs) it's paying and that mike's paying a lot of money to run for that office (laughs) a lot of a lot of gas a lot of miles Well, mass is a big deal and you guys put on a big party every year and uh yeah we're looking we're looking at uh looking at having a good time this uh september the weekend after after labor day in virginia beach so Hopefully we we we've weathered hurricanes and everything from from sun to hurricanes. So hopefully we we have sun this fall. Brother Larry, uh, you weren't at Lodge, you weren't at Grotto. <laughs> did he make breakfast? He, he he did make tall cedars, but you he missed something else. So what uh, else have you done? I, I missed Goose and Gridiron too. He didn't even get breakfast. It, 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 some physical problems, but taken care of. I I I can't. I can't even compare anything you guys have already said. So you guys all should just curtsy now at Grand Tall Cedar, Larry Maris. <laughs> <laughs> By the way, Larry, your voice is sounding good tonight. Yeah, it is. I wonder why. I have no idea. <laughs> Must be the iced tea we it's had at uh, Applebee's. Yeah. Yeah. So what about me, um, the Valley of Reading. Uh, last night, I got um, installed as junior warden for the. Rose Croy line. He's an elected officer now. Watch That's out. That's correct. Uh, congratulations. It's fun. It's a uh, it, it, no hats though. No, no hats. hats. Okay. <laughs> just just, just <laughs> wait till your first executive board meeting. Just need to confirm. I'm going to go next week. I'm invited, but I don't have a vote. Right. You, you can talk, but you can't vote. <laughs> well. Because I'm still technically in the Valley of Lancaster, that's what I, I can't do anything anyway. You, you can't vote on the money because that's a large perfection function. Right. People right. are looking at me like I'm not voting on like unanimous things. I'm like, I'm not a member of your lodge of perfection. I can't vote. Um, but a lot of practices How leading come up. we never transferred? Because I think I sent the email to the secretary and it just never got done. I, I tried to do the same thing, yeah. I think I need to uh, have it served by a constable to get it completed. <laughs> talk, talk to Jeff Moore. Uh, I know a guy. Yeah. Um, I do too. So, uh, yeah, we had reunion seasons done. We had a little bit of excitement at the Valley of Reading. Um, we were doing the uh, 23rd degree, and there's a, I guess, I don't know if you call it a prop, but we, uh, we have a smoke machine that we do for mm-hmm. part of the degree. And... I'm down in the makeup room, and I'm listening on a speaker, and it really does sound like you're like in a, the bowels of a submarine with this guy. He goes, you hear, that's enough smoke. That's enough smoke. <laughs> Cut it with the smoke. <laughs> <laughs> and then you see all the fire alarms going chirp. <laughs> and the fire department came, and, you know, and like, but anyway, we got we no, we got back on stage. We finished the degree, and uh, no one was hurt. It was fun. It was just a long afternoon because of that. I'm pleased to report. I failed to mention this. We had no open mics in uh, Harrisburg this well, time. That was, oh, well, that was a good thing. That's true. Our special guest was uh, former guest, the uh, uh, illustrious brother Ed Stump. The Grand Smoke. The Grand Smoke. The Grand That's Smoke. Right. Mm-hmm. And one funny thing was, he was giving a talk, and nobody knew. It just kind of worked out perfectly about humor and and like how much fun he's had over the years in the Masons. And he really gets about a minute into his talk and um, the stage manager just starts walking out on stage with his headset on and he's carrying what I thought was a box. And he's like, uh, Commander-in-Chief, is it okay if I bring this out? 
<laughs> it was a riser. Because if you know Ed, Ed, Ed is not the tallest man. So they, they made Ed stop his speech and they put down this one foot riser. <laughs> and then Ed got up on top of the riser and, and he could see his over talk. the podium. Yeah. <laughs> and and the, well, actually, the audience could see him now. Uh, so it was fun. So <laughs> it was a good time had by all. Good. Josh. Not a thing. <laughs> well done, past master Josh Lambert and Killer. Hang on, hang on. I I want to I want to correct that. Josh puts together this show. That's right. Out of the dreck that is cast his direction, Josh works very hard every week, every two weeks, to put this together. So don't say you didn't do anything Masonic because you did. This matters, and we appreciate it a lot. Indeed. Amen. Amen. And we got you a bookmark. Yes, congratulations. <laughs> it's just for you. That's a nice bookmark. Yeah. All right, well, let's take a quick break. We're going to come back, and we are going to interview the illustrious potentate of Zembo Shrine when we come back. Why choose George J. Grove & Sons for your next home improvement project? At George J. Grove & Sons, we've built our reputation on quality and trust for more than 50 years. For planning, to materials, to installation, George J. Grove promises a home improvement experience second to none. Whether your goal is reducing energy costs, decreasing maintenance, updating curb appeal, or simply increasing the value of your home, the George J. Grove team will recommend and provide solutions that stand the test of time. Call 717-393-0859 for an estimate or visit us at georgejgrove.com. There you go. There we go. Now we're really back. So um, our guest tonight is, uh, as I stated earlier, well, actually two guests. We have uh, Mike Smith <laughs> and Seth Anthony from uh, Zembo Shrine, among other things. Welcome. And uh, Mike, tell us a little bit about your year at Zembo Shrine and things that you wanted to accomplish, things you're trying to accomplish, and what's going on at Zembo. Sure. Well, we... Uh, <clears throat> The, the kind of the elephant in the room is our building, I would say, and and uh, we have literally it's in the room on the on the table in front of me. <laughs> it is. There's a little uh, a wine little, bottle little, thing a little wine that's bottle. on our table Correct. right now. Correct. So, so uh, it, as many many uh, Central Pennsylvania Masons know, our building was for sale for four or five years, and that kind of fell through for several reasons, and. Um, I, I honestly didn't want to have to deal with that again this year, and I, I told the guys I think we need to look at this from a different lens. We have a beautiful building. It needs work, but let's let's look at this differently. So um, the big thing coming up is at our June 3rd stated meeting, we are going to have a vote of our membership to proceed with adding the building to the National Registry of Historic Places. So... Uh, <clears throat> we think that's kind of a, a foundation for the future for us for to obtain some grant money and other support. So, it's, from what I've read, it sounds like a win-win. Is there was there any downside to it? <clears throat> well, I'm gonna. I'm are you, gonna. Are you committed that you can never ever blow it up? Wait, well, will, will, <laughs> will this episode drop before or after that meeting? <laughs> Just no, I, I, will, I would love to answer these questions, okay. actually. And okay. Seth, Seth has been very instrumental in this, too. Because uh, from what I read, it seems like it's overwhelmingly positive. I, I agree. There's, I've not personally found one negative to, to this, to adding our building to the registry. Um, quite honestly, and, and uh, you know, all joking aside, your question about blowing it up, we we spoke several times with the. Uh, <laughs> Wait, what? We're not going. We to didn't blow talk it up. about that. No, but, we did uh, not. No, no. But we we There's could. too much asbestos in it. It'll never say, burn. Yeah, it, won't, it won't. It won't. Will not burn down. Um, but we we've talked several times with uh, PHMC <clears throat> in Harrisburg, who they're the that's the state body that approves the application. And uh, we could be approved for the National Registry and literally the next day tear the building down. Oh. So, um, 
you know, Seth, what am I missing? There, I mean, that that's kind of the overarching. I that, had, that was a big question. I, I had heard that um, it there that there are restrictions on modifications to the building. So Is that no, not correct? No modifications. They they don't or no restrictions. I should say. Okay. Excuse me. No no restrictions on modifications. They don't come out again after the the building has been approved for the registry. Um, you know, and that that's been actually the biggest misnomer that we've been trying to mm -hmm. to debunk this spring is that we can do it's still our building if we wanted to paint the walls pink in the tile room we could um i recommend against well, just saying yeah, but, yeah. obviously that okay. kind of defeats yeah. the purpose of historical <laughs> preservation <laughs> same, unless, same with tearing unless down Susan J. Building. coleman's going to give you a grant right right <laughs> even uh, <laughs> but uh no there's there's no restrictions on on work to the building we could tear it down um it opens the doors for grant money mm -hmm. Uh, what else, what am I missing, Seth? Yeah, to, <clears throat> to Jack's point, I think part of that is there's the National Historic Registry and there's a National Historic Landmark. And the landmark designation is much more restrictive, and that's where you get into the whole can't make changes, it has Got to be it. historically accurate. The registry has tens of thousands of places on it, and once you spend the effort to get on it, you could just write a letter and say, we don't want to be on this anymore and you're off of it. The, tr the trick is it opens you up for grant money, and probably the only downside is it just creates more work for you if you want the grant money, because you, you need that to, to really make it function. You have to have a grant writer do that for you. That's a good I'm, just, I'm, just counting, I'm just counting the number of times we say grant money. <laughs> we would We're like up to some eight grant right now. Money. We, we would love to have grant money. Yeah. If any of you are planning to die and want to leave a legacy, it would be to the Zembo Shrine. Yeah, reach out to me. I'll give you our address. <laughs> um, and we've talked about it on the show before. The building was built in the 1920s. 1928 ah. to 1930. Yep. Yeah, and it's what's what's the style of architecture? It's, it's called um, Neo Michigas, is what it is. <laughs> Neo Michigas, <laughs> no, not not technically true. Um, of course, the name is escaping me now. It, but it is a Moroccan influenced building, and it is not a model of any other building. Um, it's just within that style. I was in Morocco for two oh, years. God. Oh God! And God. I'm going to tell you, it doesn't look like there anything. Was no, I've seen there was over no there. Zembo t style buildings in Morocco. <laughs> You're still trying to date that monkey. <laughs> I want to uh, just to circle back as far as grant writing. I want to uh, nine. If I can give a shout, yeah, it is nine. Sorry. Is he, did it stop at nine? No. Are you no, sure no, you counted correctly? I'm counting. I'm okay. Counting. I thought Larry was in charge of counting. <laughs> <laughs> We're in trouble. We, uh, we've, we've formed a partnership with his, the Historic Harrisburg Association, and uh, their executive director, David Morrison, has been an outstanding uh, sounding board, and they're, they're going to help us uh, – assuming I'm making a big assumption. I certainly don't want to be presumptuous, but – uh, assuming our membership approves this next Friday, they will uh, faci help facilitate a, a capital campaign to pay for this. And uh, the uh, the person who is going to help us do that does indeed write grants. Doesn't count. To get grant money. Ah, oh, there it is, <laughs> number 10. <laughs> ding, ding, ding. <laughs> so tell us a little bit about your year. Um, you know, some of the things you, you you also besides the building, what else, what else what else have you been trying to do for Zembo Shrine? So the 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 fun stuff is what I'm hearing from this question. So uh, again, I have to give a shout out to my wife because you know I've forgotten to introduce her or my children many times over the course of the the Seth shaking his head. He oh. knows he knows it's true. Uh. Um, I'm on a I'm on a uh, two day. Uh, consecutive streak of doing it correctly though and not forgetting anyone on the divan or my family so uh are you going to make sure she listens to this show absolutely right? okay, <laughs> yeah absolutely that'll give us four well, that eliminates about yes. four yeah. of my questions then. <laughs> so uh no we uh we've been traveling a lot and uh, uh lauren is very supportive she's She's only said no to me once as far as Zembo, and that's when I said, you know, I'd really think I'd look good in a mini car. And, and she said no very quickly and, and took the checkbook from me. Um, but, no, she, she, and, she and our three daughters are very supportive. We've traveled to, uh, to Washington, to Virginia several times. 
Uh, actually, my daughter, my oldest daughter, who is 13, she's attending uh, a ball with me in uh, Wilmington, Delaware, in two weeks. So, uh, you know, they they have been supportive. I can't I can't say that enough. And and of course, we've we've made a lot of friends um, along the way. Uh, we were, we were down in Roanoke, Virginia, two weeks ago at Kazim Shrine. And I sat with uh, illustrious Sir Charlie Pope, who is the the uh, potentate of Zamora Shrine in Birmingham, Alabama. So uh, just just meeting wonderful people, literally from all over the country, all over. So well, now it's time to pat you on the back a little bit. <clears throat> you had a very successful circus. We did. So we tell did. us, and, and for the people out there that hear circus, they automatically get angry. Sure. Um, no animals. Well, we had we we did not have exotic animals. Okay, we had uh, household uh, pets. Cat. There was <laughs> <laughs> my my there was the goldfish parade. Monkey rodeo. Yeah. Monkey rodeo. Whatever. We had uh, there was a couple cowboy monkey rodeo. I believe there was a couple pigs who were uh, they they were pretty impressive. I didn't I didn't know you could train a pig to do tricks and stuff, but uh, a llama and some goats, I believe. <laughs> So uh, gotta have goats. Gotta leave have it alone. Goats. Yeah, <laughs> just leave it alone. <laughs> <laughs> Jack, Jack, Jack's just itching so we, to um, make a Johnny Depp alpaca joke. Yeah. Yeah. So we, you know, we took a. It, it really was a leap of faith. Um, you know, in 2020, we were literally in the middle of our circus when uh, it was March 13th. Uh, mm-hmm. You know, I, I'm a school principal. Our schools sh- shut down on March 13th, uh, and historically, that's a day I take off the Friday of circus. And uh, I was not at school for that. I was at the circus, and subsequently, we shut down the circus that night. And uh, we had no circus in 2021, so it was like. Okay. So you got to do all the build-up work, and not have the circus, right? Yeah. Nice. So we, uh, you know, we. Our, our members we started talking to them last fall. They wanted they wanted to do a circus, and it takes uh, I I don't know the exact number. I think it was easily 150 or 160 you know consistent volunteers over four or five days to make this happen. Um, so the our Zembo membership and ladies I cannot forget them, uh, and, and even my own children. Uh, you know. I, I don't, I'm not sure if I violated child labor laws, but I had them selling <laughs> uh, circus programs. Uh, so anyway, we had uh, we worked with uh, Jim Hammond, who is a third generation Shriner, um, and uh, they they just produced a tremendous circus for us. We had eight shows, and uh, we cut it back from ten shows to eight, and that gave me a little little anxiety and. Uh, I think, you know, Seth from the technology side of things, he was giving me like daily reports on online ticket sales. And uh, we were about two weeks out and I was like, oh, good Lord, I just want to break even on this circus. I don't want to, you know, lose our lose our tails on this. And, and as it turns out, we had four of eight shows sold out. And uh, just just a tremendous, tremendous support from our members and our their ladies and, and of course, our community who came and bought tickets and spent money we sold out of almost all food and we did sell out of all the toys so just just and you also came up with a cool idea this year you guys did um a mini golf now it was the first year but it was still successful right so in february we had uh we had a mini golf uh uh, husband and a wife team from harrisburg do this for uh you know various non-profits throughout the area and uh they they just uh, came in on a on a Friday with a box truck with all of the, the the equipment and the courses the pieces to the course and we turned our tile room and uh, and our auditorium into an 18 hole mini golf course. Ah, awesome! It it was fun. You have to check out our Facebook page. Our our minister of propaganda. Um, <laughs> has has posted uh, a that's lot an of, affectionate office term, right? Oh, yeah, that, that's, that's yeah. a f- no, that's official. That's an official. <laughs> I can't get a fez with that on it because they charge by letter. <laughs> <laughs> I looked into it. Just it was prop. I couldn't Just afford prop. it. Mid as prop. long as you look like Baghdad Bob, maybe you can get a beret. <laughs> there you go. <laughs> so, uh, no, Seth, the, I think uh, you could pull it off, buddy. I, I, he it's could. My goal. He could. So the uh, the the mini golf was also very successful. <clears throat> So, t- 
Talk about what it takes to become potentate other than just showing up at the bottom of the line and waiting I'll, your I'll time. Some 20 grand. Well, that's that's actually, well, I, was, <clears throat> I was wondering if we could touch on that. Absolutely, we can. Okay, Because, you know, I think, I think the time and the financial commitment is something that, that uh, I'll definitely I can speak to accurately. So my, my own circumstances is somewhat unique um, in an unfortunate way, not, not for myself, but I was serving as uh, chief aide to the potentate uh, Joe Roop in 2000. Uh, 19. And uh, unfortunately, of course, many of you knew Larry Faunastock. He, mm-hmm. he passed away unexpectedly. And uh, I believe that was on a Friday mm-hmm. uh, in, in maybe April. It was in the springtime, around this time. Mm-hmm. And uh, the, the divan, of course, met the next morning, and, and I got a phone call. I had already announced that I intended to run for the, the divan in the fall, but uh, – they, the divan called me and said, you know, uh, Larry passed away. We need someone now. Would you do this? And uh, here I am. <laughs> so you jumped right to the top. <clears throat> so I jumped. <clears throat> so the, the, the divan and shrine is a, is a – the moving divan is – the elected divan, I should say, is a five-year commitment from, like in Seth's case, Oriental Guide to Ponte. I'm doing it in three and a half Okay. So I, I'm on the fast track. <laughs> um, so that that's kind of how I got here. Uh, you know, again, unfortunate and unexpected circumstance, but uh, it, it's been a good experience. And uh, you know, as far as the time commitment, um, you know, so, some of you guys who know me, you know, when I when I get involved, um, I I. Uh, I jump off the high dive into the shallow end <laughs> sometimes <laughs> for lack of a better, uh, you know, a better description. But, uh, you know, as I've talked to guys, and, and I know Seth, when we coerced and twisted his arm into joining us as Oriental Guide this year, um, I said, well, I've, I've kept track of every dollar I've spent since I joined the divan. And I've also kept track, at least this year, of every event that I had as as potentate. So uh, I believe our installation was, uh, yeah, I keep saying June, January 7th. And I think I've been on the road uh, 67 or 68 percent of the days. That doesn't include phone calls or emails. Now, I will tell you that, and Seth, I know, will... uh, he'll agree or, you know, tell me I'm, I overdo things, but I told my wife, you know, last fall, I said, listen, we get one shot at doing this and I'm, I'm going all in. I'm, I'd be a horrible poker player. I'm going all in. Right. So I go to almost all club and unit meetings. Uh, and again, we've, we've done a lot of traveling out of state too. So, and we will, the rest of the year we'll continue to travel out of, out of state. It's the, if I can give a plug, it is the 150th year anniversary of Shriners International, uh, and that big celebration is in New York City the end of September. It may be more importantly, it is the 100th anniversary of uh, our first hospital in Shreveport, Louisiana. Mm-hmm. So it's two big, mm-hmm. uh, two big milestones for, for Shriners International and, and Shriners Children's, which mm-hmm. was formerly Shriners Children's Hospital. So... Uh, so Seth kind of mentioned the financial um, expense. Uh, is it is it true? I'll ask it this way: Is it true <clears throat> that you don't get a lot of money from the shrine itself to pay for your travel, to pay for your training, et cetera? So <clears throat> I have not received a dollar. I've not received a penny, to be even more specific. Mm-hmm. Everything is on my dime. Um, as far as trainings, like like uh, it, it's now required that Oriental Guide they have a a, tra- a leadership training mm-hmm. in Tampa, Florida, right. and same with the res- the assistant Raban. Uh, now Zembo, we do pay for that. Okay. Uh, you know, I we're required to one, okay. <laughs> <laughs> uh, and and two, common sense just dictates we should do that. Well, yeah. So uh, those trainings are paid for, uh, but everything else is on your own. Now I, I will say many. Many of our clubs and units, when you're potentate, they do pay for your dinner or, or whatever the event is. So I've had some potentates, past potentates, mm-hmm. say that 
in order to go from the bottom of the line through their year as potentate, have, they've experienced somewhere in the neighborhood of like twenty thousand dollars of their own money in that time frame. That's correct. Okay. Um, and again, I, I'm a, I'm a very uh, analytical person. I, I love Excel <coughs> spreadsheets. I, I've kept a spreadsheet because I wanted to. You know, you hear the horror stories and you don't know if they're true or they're mm-hmm. not. And and uh, you know, I've spent in excess of that. Now I will tell you, we're it's it's kind of a tradition, I guess. It's not a written rule, but the potentate has a trip. Um, so we're going to Bermuda in uh, three weeks, I believe, and uh, taking my whole family. And and obviously a cruise to Bermuda for five is is kind of pricey, and uh, that's included in that. So it's it's like I've included my family because I I value that and. Uh, you know, obviously that that costs money too. But it's things that we can do as a family. Who, you know, my wife always teases me that I never take her on a non Masonic date, or or with people who are not Masonic. Uh-huh. Like, you know, like we we eat dinner s- several times with Seth and Stacy, but and we love them to death. But my wife says we never go on a non Masonic date, and I said, does it matter? I'm I'm paying. So <laughs> Seth, so Seth and Stacy are boring. Is that what you're saying? Absolutely not. Absolutely not. <laughs> well, honestly, so, the prices don't well, sound. Stacy's not anyway. Just... Yeah, well, I believe that <laughs> the price. Yeah, you know, it doesn't sound because the guys in, that are in the Grotto National Line, I think theirs is eight years. Now it's the National Line, right? But they're spending. Ten to fifteen thousand dollars a year. They get no, even the national line. They don't get any reimbursement until they're Grand Monarch. So, I mean, but I've historically heard Shrine, if you, especially if you think about twenty, thirty years ago, mm-hmm. when there was thousands of members, there was a bunch of big hitters, all oh. trying to get that job for the status, mm-hmm. and they were throwing money around to get elected. Yeah. I, I can tell you just taking Mike's cue, I started a spreadsheet in the first six, five months, six months now. Um, I'm just a little under three grand in, in the first six months, going to Shrine events, doing, you know, you buy a raffle ticket, you yeah. you know, $20 raffle tickets and $20 dinners add up. Yeah. And, 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 and suddenly you're in for, for three grand and you go, wait, where did all that money come from? And, yeah. and, and Seth is, is spot on with, with that. You know, I'm... I'm I don't know. I don't want to say it on air because my wife will know the actual number. <laughs> <laughs> no, I'm teasing. She knows what the number is. But um, that's that's the big thing. And again, it's what you make of it. You know, it, it's like being a leader of any organization, whether you're a school principal mm-hmm. or you own your own business or whatever. If you're out and and you're with the members and you're supporting them. They're going to support you and and the organization. So, you know, this is my third night this week, and and it's Wednesday. We were at Perry Junior Atta Shrine Club Monday, uh, uh, Lebanon. Excuse me, Lebanon on Monday, Perry Junior Atta on Tuesday, and obviously visiting with you guys tonight. So, well, this must feel very cosmopolitan after Perry County and Lebanon County. All right, yeah, easy, <laughs> easy. I'm a Perry County, Perry County boy. That's my home club. That's that's the. That's the closest Zembo event that I attend. It's 11 miles from home. So, uh, no, it, 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 again, and it goes back to what I said earlier. I, I jump off the high dive right into it, and, and uh, I wouldn't trade it for the world. I really wouldn't. So, Well, let's take a quick break, and uh, we will come back with more after this. As far back as the mid-1800s, records exist describing the pre-meaning tradition of brethren smoking cigars during and after gatherings. To this day, the practice of smoking cigars remains very much alive in many lodges. This custom is considered a time for brethren to relax, exchange ideas, and enjoy the simplicity and fellowship that is the very essence of our brotherhood. This is what Hireman Solomon Cigars is all about. Our starting principles are to bring Masonic brethren together in the harmony of a good cigar. Pull up a chair, sit back, light up any of our premium cigars, and enjoy the history. Hiram and Solomon Cigars can be found at fine cigar retailers. For a complete list, visit HiramandSolomonCigars.com 
or check them out on social media to find out when they'll be at a live event near you. Hiram and Solomon Cigars is pleased to be the official cigar of the Masonic Light Podcast. So we're here with uh, potentate Mike Smith and Seth Anthony. Uh, Mike, we've been talking about your term as potentate. And um, one of the things that we mentioned during the break, we always have our best interviews during our breaks. Um, <laughs> I, I noticed that. Yeah. Um, you know, the Shrine is probably the most recognizable Masonic organization in the entire world. Um, you know, people literally all over the place. Uh, know about Shriners mainly through the hospitals. Um, there's some fantastic PR that goes on. And the, and the Fez of Red. And the Fez of Red. Right. They can all identify those symbols. Mm -hmm. And yet, as the most recognizable organization, in Masonic organization in the world, there's not a square and compass to be found. Um, any Anything you know about why that's that way? Well, I... I don't. Okay. Um, but what I certainly agree with you, you know, the, the Fez and, and even in our specific circumstances, Zembo is a, one of the, if not the most well-known building in the city of Harrisburg mm -hmm. uh, for the last 92 years. Um, so, you know, there, there's a lot of people that don't even know you need to be a Mason mm -hmm. first yeah. to become a Shriner. Um, so wh while I don't have a good answer to that, I will, I will uh, solicit the thoughts of our Minister of Propaganda, Seth Anthony. And professional fraternalist. Uh, yeah. Professional fraternalist. He absolutely like, like any good political figure, he defers to his press secretary there to you answer go. the That's hard right. questions. <laughs> that, that, oh, there's a hard question. Talk to the press secretary. We're going to circle fun. back to that one. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Tim, you, you, you raise a really good point about the lack of square and compass. And, you know, it's funny. I was just on the phone this morning with Mark Tabbert, previous, uh, previous uh, guest of the show. And, and we were having a conversation around uh, the shrine and what the shrine means and where it's at. And I think part of it is the the fez is a much more theoretically accessible symbol than, than the square and compass. In, in so much as people have seen men in parades and goofy hats for, for 50 years now, right? And they know those men contribute to a hospital and they do good work. And, and you have to meet the general public where they're at. They might not know what a square and compass means, but they know what a fez means. And Mark made a really good, a really good point to me. He said, you know, in, in a society where um, uh, the, the world ha has, has become much more inclusive and, and quite frankly, the, the role of the middle-aged guy, just in general, the role of the middle-aged guy has shrunk. We, we've got more women in office. We've got we, more mi minorities represented in office, which is great. The, the, the role of the middle-aged guy has kind of fallen to the wayside because we've always been very mercenary in our own motives. But nobody looks at a Shriner and thinks that's a bad guy, right? They see a guy in a red fez and know that guy donates his time, his money, and his energy to help kids who can't walk. And taking that moment to make a fool of yourself and say, you know, here I am. I, I could be a lawyer, a professional. I can be Harry Truman, and I can put on a silly hat and get in a parade and still do good work for kids. It, it humanizes the good work that we do, and it's the best PR vehicle we have as a fraternity. So while I'd love to slap a square and compass on everything, you have to meet people where they're at and say, this fez equals this. And it's the gateway to the square and compass. And how do we help people understand that every one of these men are Freemasons, and this is just a part of their journey and a part of where they're at? But do see, I would turn that around. I would say that, and, and in reality, it's the square and compass Agreed. that's the gateway to shrine. And while, a sh while some symbolism, whether it's a square and compass or whatever, might not make a connection with the general public. It would make Masons in general, mm -hmm. you know. I, I got you, Tim. Recognize that, but I mean, for the for the profane that don't know about the Masons, if they have any random concept, it's usually I wouldn't say negative, but they've heard all the conspiracy theories. The conspiracy yeah. theories are always around the Masons. They're not around the Shriners, right? Um, and yes, it would. I think it would help membership, but I think there's probably some bean counters on on the, that are like, 
it's not going to help on the bottom line of nope. money. No, nope. mm-hmm. it's it's not even going to help membership. It's just, it's 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 not necessary to tie back to the. You have to be a mason to be a shriner. It's not necessary because anybody that that is a mason that wants to be a shriner is going to know that or is going to learn that. Anybody that wants to be a shriner is going to learn that he has to first be a mason. It's not going to affect membership in any way at all. So maybe there's some insulation that happens between the two that's not a bad thing because it's going to happen when it happens. You know, I, I, I... I, I just I don't see it necessarily as well. A bad it actually thing. leads me to another point, another thing that we discussed during the break, which is the cooperation and collaboration between the various Masonic bodies. Um, you know, it used to be the case that in order to be a Shriner, mm-hmm. you had to be a Scottish Rite Mason first. That requirement was taken away. Just like in the York Rite, it used to be a requirement of the commandery that you had to belong to all of the lower York Rite bodies, and they took away the council requirement. And, and that the council requirement does still exist in some states. Okay. Just, just like I commented on Reddit today, everything mm-hmm. is jurisdictional. Right. But in Pennsylvania, you do not need to be a council. That's right. And so, I mean, and we're all, whether it's Shrine, whether it's Scottish Rite, whether it's York Rite, whether it's our Blue Lodges, we're all in need of more good men. Um. We've heard that time and time again. Um, and, and so my, wh- while it may not be, quote, unquote, necessary, um, anything we can do to recognize that we're all part of the same brotherhood, I think, helps us all. The whole concept of, you know, rising tide lifts all boats, mm-hmm. um, you know, well, I think I think, I think we're seeing I think we are seeing. It, nothing. Did, did Tim just quote Ronald Reagan? Yes, I did. I think he did. I did. Wow. I mean, okay. look, we've been around. Bless his heart. You know, the shrine's been around for 150 years. Freemasonry's been around for, if you ask Larry, 3 million years. <laughs> right. That's close. Um, so you got to remember, you know, it's easy to say when things like Georgia finally having amity with uh, the Prince Hall Lodge. So, you know, up here, <clears> we're like, that's way past time. Things move really slow in the Masonic circles. But this year I saw the northern and southern jurisdiction of Scottish Rite and Shriners Shrine International put out a joint letter basically saying you need to honor your Masonic obligations. obligations. Absolutely. Right. So, I mean, I think we're starting to, I mean, well, in all fairness, I only read the first paragraph. <laughs> <laughs> so if you read there were more. No, the, there were no pictures. Uh, <laughs> too many words. Elementary school teacher. <laughs> uh, no, it, and uh, it, it, that uh, joint statement by the, uh, you know, the sovereign grand commanders of both jurisdictions and the imperial potentate, Bill Bailey, um, was very timely. Um you know, in, in Harrisburg, we just like any Masonic body, we have we have, you know, our issues and challenges and everything else. That's true of every everyone. Um, but but I will uh, I would like to give a shout out to uh, the commander in chief of the Valley of Harrisburg, Bud Baker. Um, he became a Shriner last, I don't know, maybe November. Mm-hmm. Does that sound right, Seth? Sounds right. And uh, he's he's been back to every meeting and. Uh, you know, obviously, Tim and I are, are officers in the uh, the Lodge of Perfection. Emphasis on the perfection. Best, the best line. It's yeah. known by many yes. to be the best line. Not right? everybody can get into Rose Croy. It's okay. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, I, I think there the there's value in that for members of both bodies. And I'm speaking specific to Harrisburg now. Mm-hmm. I, I think there's value in... Uh, uh, in that, that, that members can see uh, Commander in Chief Bud uh, attending Zembo meetings, and they there's value in them seeing me involved in in uh, the Valley of Harrisburg. So, it, it's a building block, um, and and uh, Bud and I we have a wonderful working relationship that we're, you know, trying to do some joint things, and uh, I think the future is bright. So. You know, to Tim's point, and something I've spent a lot of time thinking about over the last couple of months, 
I, I've jokingly started building a presentation that might might debut at Ephrata. I got to see what time timelines happen uh, at a lodge meeting. Uh, I'm building this presentation. I'm calling it the Rite of Day Class A. You know, a very a very fancy name. But if you know what Day Class A means, it's it's kind of the I'm from Perry County. Yeah, I, I got to Perry County this up. Uh, <laughs> the right, the the right of the tacky maybe is the right way to say it. Uh, but but when you look back at at really the golden age of fraternalism, especially from the 20s forward, you had that requirement that you be a Scottish Rite Mason or a Knight Templar to be a Shriner. Mm-hmm. And, and whether we, we like to admit it or not, tens of thousands of men joined the Scottish Rite merely to become a Shriner. And, and yeah, the, there was a lot of, of vitriol over that. Like, oh, we, we took in all these members just so they could be a Shriner, and they had to maintain that membership to be a Shriner. And you look at, look around the country at these wonderful Scottish Rite temples and the York Rite stuff, and you have to be realistic and say to yourself, a lot of this was built on the back of those guys who paid a lot of dues to be able to walk across the parking lot and put a fez on. And they had nothing to do with the Scottish Rite. And whether that's right or wrong is neither here nor there. It's the fact that they financially contributed and we were able to build these amazing amazing edifices and contribute to the Scottish Rite as it became today, and the commandery, because they, Knights Templar was the other option. Those organizations benefited from the goofiness that was the, the public image that became the Shrine. Because how many times, if everybody in this room, when you said, I'm a Mason, somebody goes, I don't know what that is. Do you know who the Shriners are? You ever see a red fez in a parade? And they go, oh, yeah, yeah, all those guys are Masons. It becomes a very quick cultural cliche to say that. And it's not just the Shrine. The Shrine's kind of the most well-known piece. But sitting here with two past monarchs and two past uh, Grand Tall Cedars, you, you look back at Atlantic City in the 1950s when the Tall Cedars were at their heyday in those parades, they were doing the same thing. When Grotto was at its heyday in those parades, people didn't understand why it was a black fez or a red fez. They just kind of knew they were Masons doing good work, right? So if it weren't for that public PR thing that we did in those goofy side groups, would Masonry have the public perception and recognition that it does today if not even because of the good PR, but because of the money that came through those groups that allowed them to sustain and build what they did. Because how many guys joined a lodge to become a Shriner in, in, in that heyday? Just, just kind of a, a bigger point. I'm, I'm actually curious to Jack's thoughts on this. Because I, I know Jack's a, a strong proponent of Blue Lodge Freemasonry. Um, you know, how, how do we Not to the exclusion of, of appendant bodies, uh, but um, for a new Mason in, in particular... You, you have to put your roots down in your blue lodge. You have to, you have, to have a place that's your mother lodge, right? And, and then after you've done that, you, you certainly should explore other, you know, other aspects of Freemasonry. But I, I, I go back to what I said earlier. I don't think it matters. I, I, really, I really think that um, – like I've been exposed just in the podcast and sitting in this chair over the last couple of weeks – I've been exposed You're to more. Exposed. I've I've exposed myself. To... Have you have you talked to HR? Oh wait a minute, let me back up a little bit. Right. No, I, I've I've been exposed to more about the shrine, um, in in this podcast studio, than I have in the last f- sixteen years of Freemasonry. Nobody in my Blue Lodge talks about shrine. Nobody. Well, and I, I you know, I'm I'm the potentate now for almost six months and that's a common theme in central pennsylvania and and i don't know why that is but i've i've been to shrewsbury lodge i've been to uh uh, mount lebanon Mm -hmm. in in lebanon obviously Mm -hmm. Uh, i was just invited to milton and you know those are all an hour and a half from my house those are those are at the extremes of the zembo oasis and and there are masons that have never ever heard a presentation on shrine or at and, least and, an entertaining one an entertaining I mean, yeah. one fair <laughs> enough right yeah. well, well let me just say there are masons who have never heard an, a, a boring one either. <laughs> uh, <clears throat> and, and not to say that i'm the best you know public speaker or or presenter but to me that's a shame well you're used to speaking to children so this is a great audience fair <laughs> enough fair <laughs> enough I'm, I'm allowed to be a little more inappropriate tonight though, that is but a, to that point you know in Eureka West Shore Lodge, we have several past potentates. Past potentates. Yes. The last shrine presentation in my lodge was in my year as master 
in 2015. Seven back, years back, ago. Back in my year. Seven years back ago. Back in your year. And that was a joint presentation when we had the Fez Wars. Okay. Ah. Um, we had a Fez night, and so you could wear your grotto or your uh, Zimbo shrine hat or Fez. Uh, and we basically had a Larry, presentation. Larry would call it a hat. A hat, right. I was speaking like <laughs> It's a play. Um, basically had both organizations talk about their organizations. Yeah. Uh, but I think we, it, what that says is in all of our appended bodies, we have to be much more intentional. So, so, I agree. So, Seth and I have that conversation yeah. all the time, don't we? Yeah. I- interestingly, if, if you the, the Conference of Grandmasters of North America, for, for what it's worth, and it's a small audience there but an important one, I think it was Brent Morris that just did a presentation about – they, they did a, a, a study for the Southern Jurisdiction of the Scottish Rite and proved that if a man was a member of the Southern Jurisdiction, the chances he was going to be suspended for nonpayment of dues was significantly less than if he was a Blue Lodge member only. Right. And, and that's the same argument across all of these appended bodies, oh, I right? Agree. I agree with if, that. If you're right. happy doing something in Freemasonry, even if you're not active in your Blue Lodge, you're going to keep paying those Blue Lodge dues. So it's a golden handcuff. In a way. Yeah. In a way it is. And I'm a great example, right? I went through commandery. I did all kinds of stuff before I was master of my lodge. But I was a better master because I had done all of those other things first and it was a training ground. But but with that in mind, you know, the shrine is is unique in all of this stuff. And the grotto and the tall cedars could be. Depends on where their leadership is at. We have no purpose other than to have fun. Right. There's no there's no hidden secret old timey mysteries in the shrine. What? Yeah. <laughs> uh, but believe it or not, it was all made up in 1872. Oh, man, you're just killing it. now. Yeah, it was made up. So the shrine exists to do whatever the members want to do. In the 20s, they wanted to march around and act like a military unit. That's great. Today, they want to barbecue and smoke cigars. That's great, too. The shrine shrine's the only group that really allows <laughs> that kind of flexibility because at the end of the day, the Scottish Rite still has to do reunions. Mm-hmm. They still have degrees. They still have a, a base they need to do, and that's a very specific base <clears throat> to them. But we've also included the after right. cigars you, and You can do things. all that Absolutely. stuff, and you're building upon that. Yeah. But shrine doesn't have to do a reunion to right. have an afterglow. Right. We can have an afterglow be, because we want to have an afterglow. <laughs> <laughs> it's so, a different world. So I have, a, I have a question for Seth. Seth said something to me a little while back when he decided he was going to jump into uh, this role as Oriental Guide. And I asked why you were doing it. And you steered me. I, I'll let you mention the organization. I, I won't. But you were a, a local, the, the equivalent of a worshipful master in a non-Masonic organization that's mm-hmm. similar. And you were officially or unofficially talked to about doing something more on a national level. Mm-hmm. And you declined. Mm-hmm. And and you said something that was really profound. Do, oh, you, rem- do you remember that or do I have to rem- remind you? Uh, r- remind me because it makes for better radio. <laughs> <laughs> um, basically, you know, you said that like – you you could invest as much time, all your time and all your energy, and it still wasn't going to change the direction of that organization. It's true. And but you felt like there was hope, or there was the shrine had a path mm-hmm. forward, or something. So can you elaborate on that a little bit? Yeah. So I mean, when when I looked at this, and, and you know, when when you sign on, and and a guy like Mike comes to you and says, hey do you want to spend five years of your life in $20,000? And he has to make a good uh, a good persuasive argument. And I'm not a salesman. Uh, he's a principal, not a salesman, and boys and girls. Uh, yeah, you, you have to have some kind of vision for what it is. We've got some sales territory that's open if you'd like to, <laughs> uh, you know. Uh, th- th- Seth, there's a small Seth, fee. Seth knows I'm not a salesman. Th- there's a small fee that goes with that. Uh, yeah, th- <clears throat> the reality is locally and nationally, to kind of Tim's point earlier, the shrine's the best PR vehicle Freemasonry has. Right. And I said this in an email to a past potentate today. Yeah, the hospitals are a wonderful thing. Uh, fundraising for the hospitals are not my passion. It's a great thing that we do. I'm happy to contribute to it. It's a great charity. But without a local shrine center, there's no hospitals. You, you have to have those local shrine centers to support. A- and when we think about the Harrisburg area, and we've actually had this in the last couple of weeks, uh, 
people know what Zembo Shrine is. They know JFK campaigned there. They know Harry Truman was there. They saw Alice Cooper there in 1972 <laughs> doing a set list. They saw Bobby Brown there in 1989. They watched Hulk Hogan whoop some poor sap's butt in 1986. What like, you gonna do, brother? Right. Like, that's what they know Zembo Shrine for. <laughs> and and we had somebody say, oh yeah, I'm going to a graduation at Zembo. And we went, there's no rentals on the, on the, on the calendar at Zembo. And we looked at, oh, the graduation was at Scott Scottish right. Yeah. They have no idea what a Scottish right is. Right. They know what a Zembo is. Yeah. And, and so for better or for worse, the image of Freemasonry in central Pennsylvania for a lot of the general public <clears throat> is tied up in a big imposing building sitting at third and division streets in Harrisburg. Mm-hmm. So we have an we have an option. We can sell that building and divorce ourselves from that image and start from ground zero. Or we can save that building and help the general public understand what Freemasonry is through Zembo. And I think it's much better to start at level 50 and try to build up than sell it, wash our hands, and walk away. So as a PR guy, and and one of my proud statements is I'm the only Master Mason that's ever worked in the public relations office for the Grand Lodge. And I said that. Propaganda. Yeah. And I've said that to, to past Grand Masters and many. It's the best PR vehicle we have for the fraternity. And if we wash our hands of it, whether you're a Zembo member or not, you're, you're washing your hands of 92 years of history and the best yep. PR vehicle yep. we have. No. That's the right decision. That, that exactly. Absolutely, hands down without well, question. Well, I think part and parcel to that, though, is the issue that all of us are facing, which is the declining membership. Mm-hmm. Exactly. At its heyday – Zimbo had how many members? So I, I don't know if it was it's a, at its highest, but I know in, in uh, 1980 we had 10,000 12,000 was 12, the highest. 12,000 was the highest. Okay. In the 70s. Uh, and now you're what? at 1,484. One, 1, okay. I looked today. Okay. <laughs> uh, yeah. And I mean, yeah. all of our organizations are struggling with membership losses, mainly as the generational groups change. Uh, the World War II folks have exactly. passed on. We've Seth um, and I have waxed philosophically about this, you yeah. know, as we've traveled throughout central Pennsylvania and and uh, we're never going to return to that we're level. We're not uh, what is No, it? you're right. What, whatever the generation is millennials or whatever, they're not joiners. But we've got to find a way to make the fraternity appealing exactly. to those who again are good men who want yeah. to be better men. I think if you do the right things for the right reasons, they will come. If you build it, they will come. I mean, I, I, that's that's it's just a fact. I said to Mike on the way out, Shrine is a product that sells itself. Yes. It, 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 uh, of Freemasonry, mm-hmm. you never have to talk a guy. When you say, hey, you want to join Shrine, you never have to explain what the Shrine is to them. Right. You, if you that's say you correct. want to join Tall Cedars, they go, what's a cedar? Uh, although, <laughs> although there's a huge, I, I, th- I think, lack of – information about the shrine i mean we agree i I discovered this with our our discussion with mo um a couple of weeks ago um you know there's there's all this ground chatter in blue lodge masonry about affinity lodges and uh, we need like hunter's lodge and we need golfer's lodge and we need uh, uh, join shrine exactly it's right it's there already Do whatever you want and yeah and if we don't have it you can create it. Yeah, make your right. own. Yeah, exactly. you, you can do whatever you want. And, and you know, I'll, I'll I'll tackle the. And I know I've said this on the podcast before, but I, I think it bears repeating. It, it's not that millennials aren't joiners. We are absolutely joiners. Are you a millennial? I am a millennial. <laughs> I, 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 I've scared. I've scared God, Mike now. I gotta go. I, I've ruined oh, it. Oh, we, we, we are ab- I, uh, okay, boomer. The things you learn <laughs> about about someone when so, you're on so, a podcast. No. But, but think about it this way. When millennials went to high school, you did everything. You joined track. You did chorus. You did all of these things in high school because that's what colleges wanted to see. And mom and dad said, go ahead and do all that. So you did all those things in maybe your freshman or sophomore year. Did you run hurdles? I didn't. <laughs> I, as in, I hurdled myself when I tried, yes. He's a pole vaulter. Yeah. Uh, so, but they, they tried. Oh, that took a minute uh, to figure out. Easy, e- easy, Jack. It'll be yeah, okay. They, they tried all of these things. And then in your, in your junior or senior year, you figured out what you were good at, right? You figured out, I, you know, I'm going to do football. Wh- whatever's going to get me a scholarship right. is what you decided to do as a junior or senior in high school. <laughs> So, so if you look at millennials today out in the workforce and in general, 
they will happily jump around between five or six things to figure out what it is they're good at and what they're like. <coughs> and they're willing to pay dues to five or six things. I'm a member of Harrisburg Young Professionals. I, all these professional organizations I'm involved with, I'm a Mason. I spend my time in the Masons because it's what I've connected with and what I'm like or, or what I like to do. And I think I see this in so many millennial professionals that they jump around to these organizations until they find what fits. So they're joiners, but they're very fickle joiners. They're happy to join for one or two years, Mm -hmm. pay dues, and then go, eh, I tried this. It's not for me. I'm moving on to the next thing. There needs to be some value added. Exactly. They're looking for what that value is. And if the fraternity can't prove that value then they're willing to move on. And this goes back to the conversation about appendant bodies. It's all well and good to say, yes, you need to have a root in your Blue Lodge. And I won't, I won't argue that at all. But if you get somebody who spends six months in Blue Lodge and goes, oh, this just isn't my thing. Like, I like being a Mason, but I'm not going to jump out on that floor and do ritual anytime soon. I don't have the time to commit to that. That's the time to have that conversation and say, okay, what is it that you do have the time to do and you like to do? What can I find in Freemasonry that will scratch the itch to keep you around. Because I'd rather invest that 30-minute conversation today to find out I'm a gun enthusiast. Cool, you know, Zembo's got a gun club. You should really talk to them about going and doing that because it it can be one night a month that you go out and do the gun thing, and that keeps you involved in the fraternity. Because 15 years from now, they go, you know, I've been a Mason all these years. Maybe it's time for me to go back to Blue Lodge. Mm -hmm. Maybe it's time for me to take that opportunity, go back and look. And and Plus, you're around guys that are talking about the other things they're into. The peer pressure, right? There's a peer pressure factor yeah. there. Yeah. So, so you know, there, there's value in that and knowing that, yeah, give them six months or a year in their Blue Lodge. Let them get that route. But if, if it's not working, find out what's going to work for them. Don't give them nothing. I don't, I don't know why Larry's, why Larry's laughing. I'm still stuck in the pole vault. <laughs> <laughs> He's so easily Larry, distracted. Larry's been a pole vaulter since 1972. <laughs> No. <laughs> Get out of my head, dog. He looks Get good in those shorts. <laughs> <laughs> so I want to go back to the intentionality that we talked about because – and this is not – I'm going to use my experience with Shrine, but it's not really about Shrine. It's about any appendant body that – Is this about online dues payments? No. <laughs> I'm, I'm going to stay away from that one because I getting, know that's, a, that's what we're we getting closer. Do. We're getting closer. Yeah. Um, so – Recently, uh, like within a few months ago, I saw a friend of mine who's a past master of a lodge uh, post that they had become a member of the past masters club, for example, at Zimbo Shrine. And I said, I didn't know Zimbo had a past masters club. Oh yeah, Shit, by the secret. way, I'll, I'll send you the I'll send you the form. It, it's in the pepper every month. But that wasn't my point. My point was I've been a past master now for almost eight years. Yeah. <laughs> I've got four past potentates sitting in my own lot. And they're not advertising. And no one ever said to me, Tim, you're in November of your year as master. Next month, you can join the Past Masters Club of Zimbo Shrine. You, too, can pay $20 a year in dues. Or 200 for a lifetime, whatever. No, the, no, no, it's not 200 Whatever it is. 150 150 for whatever. For one-time <laughs> low payment. But my point is we don't int- – we know – we know who every master in this state is. Mm-hmm. Yes. And we can cross check that with membership in any appended body. Correct. Well, why are he's we getting, well, all, you're, you're he's the, getting all digital yeah, on us? Yeah. First of all, you're the only one in Pennsylvania that understands that system, Grandview. <laughs> not not, not so, true. I not do true. understand it. I was going to say, you're, you're sitting across from <laughs> Seth here. Come on. Yeah. I do understand. So Grandview. you might have to lead that discussion. But I'm just saying, it doesn't matter if you keep yeah. it on a freaking. Abacus and be the change, whatever exactly. (laughs) And I'm doing that. I've got I'm creating a database of my Blue Lodge membership with a cross tab showing who's in the shrine, who's in the Scottish Rite, who's in Grotto, who's in Chapter Council Commandery, so that at any point I know who in my lodge belongs to what. And you're doing something very intentional. We've done. I did in Grotto when I was secretary, and we've done in our AMD council. When I was Grotto secretary, I marked down everybody who was a 33rd, yeah. everybody who was a past master, because inevitably when somebody came to Grotto and said, you're all a bunch of scallywag masons who screw around and drink, and I go, really? Because 50% of our members are past masters and 33% are 33rds. Are those the guys you think are just screwing around? And they just stare at me dumbfounded like, 
wait, what? Yeah. Like exactly. these are the most involved guys in the fraternity. Well, that's Tim, my I've, point about intentionality. Well, I think the problem is, and, and I, I was guilty of this when I got done being in the East. I was burned out. And, you know, this past potentates, and Mike's already told you how much he's been doing things. Yeah. I'm imagining that when his year is done and he takes a deep breath, he might not be like a full piss and vinegar going out there and pushing, you guys got to come out to pass master tonight. No, he's going to be the thrice he, illustrious master in the line of perfection. Right. He's moved on. <laughs> Known to many. Known to many is line. the best line. <laughs> Yeah, I, I'm just well, saying, I, I, you know, a past potentate still kind of got some burnout. Yeah. Well, and, and, and you know, being a realist, that that's probably going to be true. I hope it's not. I, I told the guys I hope they keep me around in some capacity next Jerry's year. Jerry's out. Uh, <laughs> they're still, they're still uh, wanting, wondering. Um, there's a lot of things that are happening, as we talked about earlier, with the building that I want to see through. And, and to Tim's point about intentionality – Absolutely. We, you know, we need to be more intentional with everything we do, whether it's promoting Past Masters Club or promoting our membership, because we do have the most recognizable building in Harrisburg and, and the Red Fez. And if I may, in a minute, share, share a story about the Fez, you know, it, it, to me, it really should be easy to get members if we try. Right. And, and I've told, I actually, I, you know, uh, <clears throat> Seth and I talk frequently and, and on our drive. I talk to Mike on the phone more than I talk to my wife. <laughs> I was hoping you weren't going to go there. But anyway, um, on one of our many conversations, I said, it's not that I've come up with, like, brilliant, game-changing uh, ideas this year. No one's going to outwork me. And, and. Call me what you will, arrogant or whatever, but no one will outwork me, uh, and and I and I stand behind that. So, you know, I'm not. <clears throat> to, I think Seth alluded to this earlier. It's it's I'm not going to put my effort into something that I don't find value in, or that I don't feel has a bright future. And and I think, you know, we're, we're never going to have ten thousand or twelve thousand members at Zembo again. Right. That that's just. I, it's unrealistic. I'd, I'd be drinking the purple Kool Aid, right? Right. So, but I think I think there's a tremendous upside to Zembo Shrine in Harrisburg uh, on a much smaller scale in our 92 year old building. Um, you know, and and I'm not a Gen X or, or excuse me, I'm not a millennial. I am a Gen X or by Latch several key months. kids. Uh, <laughs> but uh, <clears throat> if I may digress, you know, kind of the meaning of the Fez, that, you know, just the point of it being recognizable internationally. Um, I had just been been elected to the line. Again, I shared my story. And it was that summer I was high priest and prophet, which is the second year of the... the, the which is a pretty good title in Freemasonry, by the yeah, way. High is. priest and prophet. I was going to say it's common. Get them both, right. It's common, you know, across several, several bodies. Anyway... Um, we were in uh, we were in South Carolina in Merle's Inlet, South Carolina, and I and I said to my wife, I said, you know, I'd really like to go out to the Greenville Hospital, and uh, you know, in the western end of South Carolina. And anyway, uh, for whatever reason, my wife my wife didn't want to go or she couldn't go was was probably the story. And I said, well, I'm going to take my uh, take our oldest two daughters. We have three daughters. We took Ella and Mia. And uh, drove across Green or drove across South Carolina to Greenville. He's and not really good at geography versus like the ocean versus Greenville. It's okay. We drove, it's, we drove it's west. It's west of the ocean. We drove west. It's we drove about we three drove, and a half, four hours. We drove, it's kind of north. It was but, about four hours. We drove across South Carolina. There you go. Half right? right. They don't teach geography till middle school in Perry County. I lived in Greenville. <laughs> did you? Yeah, did I, I, was, I, drive, I was raised in Greenville. Did I drive I across right South yes, Carolina? Yes, you did. Yes. So, See, I had a, uh, uh, an unbiased second opinion on my... my Highway 25. Yeah. He's so not anyway, saying it was the right thing. He's just saying so, it was possible. Uh, <laughs> we drove to Greenville from Merle's Inlet. And uh, anyway, we, we scheduled a tour. And that's uh, Hejaz Shrine territory. Mm -hmm. And uh, had a tour, um, wonderful tour. I had my fez on, obviously. And we get almost to the end of the tour... And uh, father and a, and a, his toddler son were there, and uh, kind of in the lobby area. And uh, 
the the son was playing around like any two year old, three year old would, you know, high energy, right, little boy. And uh, the dad looked at me. I had met him, small talk, known him for maybe five minutes. And he looked at me and he pointed at my Zembo Fez and said, thank you. And I, it, it, it caught me off guard, right? And I'm usually not one that I'm, uh, you know, I like to talk, obviously, and I'm not, a, not at a loss for words. And I said, oh, well, what do you mean? And he said, thank you for what you do. And he said, my, and he told me his story. And my daughters were there. You know, I, I find, again, I shared I find value in including my family. They need to know why I'm on the road several nights sure. a week. And uh, he said his son was diagnosed in utero with club feet. And when they, you know, the diagnosis right then and there, they began, before he was even born, they, they started planning his treatment. And by the time he was two, you know, he had several surgeries and therapies and so on. He, again, I wouldn't have known otherwise if dad wouldn't have told me. But uh, didn't know me, you know, I'll probably never see that gentleman again. But he pointed at that red fez and said, thank you. He didn't know I was from Harrisburg, Pennsylvania. If he didn't know that, he wouldn't have talked to you. So, anyway. but that, Damn it's, Yankee. It's like that. I mean, really kind of make it all worthwhile. Like, and, and, I, and I told Seth, this is the honest to God truth, the, guy, the guys at Zembo have heard that story if I had a dollar. So many times. Exactly. But and what did I say coming down here about that story? You're going to tell that story until somebody makes you stop telling that story. No, that's not what I said. <laughs> I said I will tell that story till the day I die. Yeah. Uh, and, and, you know, I don't care if people get sick of hearing it. Because if that doesn't give you a fire in your belly, I, I, boy, I don't know what does. The, the hospital in Greenville was probably one of the biggest draws for the upper Piedmont, that Spartanburg, Greenville, Anderson, South Carolina area. And they were huge. It just brought members in the Blue Lodge, yep. uh, into uh, Scottish Rite, into the Shrine. It was just a big thing. <laughs> and the Shrine Club in Greenville was outstanding. Interesting point, just for the edification of the listeners, uh, Imperial Sir Mark Hartz from Baltimore was at our last meeting and noted the busiest quote unquote hospital, which I don't even believe is a hospital, it's a clinic, Correct. right? In all of Shrindoms in, in Mexico, it, it's the, they're looking beyond the United States mm -hmm. to say, you know, we've done a really good job of treating kids in the United States, but there's kids all over the world that need this help. So we talk about the, the, the impact of the Fez on the streets of Harrisburg, but there's kids in Mexico who don't have two nickels to rub together. But know that it was a guy in a red fez that yes. gave his money to fix their feet so they we, could walk. We're treating uh, two two children from the Ukraine right now in Boston who had burns from from, the, from, from the a war from a missile attack. Yeah. Wow. So that that and, was in the news. And recently. that's interesting because Shrind Shrindom is not in Europe. If I'm not yes, mistaken. Yes, it is. In it Germany, is? Yes. But, but it's not widely spread. It's not, it's not widely. like the United States. Yeah. You you know Masons over there have. A clue because they, they know about the hospitals in the United States, mm -hmm. but there's no valid shrines over there. He noted, you know, it used to be the, the line we had, what, 22 shrine hospitals, whatever the number yeah. was. Historically, you know, the, the yeah, the yeah. historically it was 22 hospitals and the and the phrase was, uh, you know, free, free treatment, free medical care. But but now there's more than a hundred locations. Right. They just opened a shrine clinic in Doylestown. Yeah, clinic <laughs> clinics. I mean, there's there's still some. It's a lot of cheap real estate in Doylestown. <laughs> <laughs> you know, but but the, but the world has changed. Yeah. We don't need clinics, a hospital. Clinics, right. hospital, right. outpatient right. clinics. Right. Uh, and and it's just kidding, Doylestown. We love you. Yes, we do. All, and, all those uh, listeners at Doylestown Lodge. Yeah, um, both of them. Yeah. But it, <laughs> You know, and, and the terminology paint changed because of laws and so forth. And it's, uh, you know, patients can get treatment regardless of their ability to pay. But I, I think it was actually uh, Imperial Sir Mark shared that there's over 160 locations, clinics, hospitals, outpatient centers. So Wow. Yeah. That's great. So, well, we're going to take a break. Uh, a, we've got to pay some bills. It's a good idea because... We are recording our second show with this. Do you realize that? Time Probably is. so. Yeah, we've got two shows uh, out of I'm this. I'm going for the Nate Minnick. But we're going to uh, <laughs> we're going to pay some bills. Uh, we've got to hear the news from Walter. And we'll come back and wrap up tonight's episode. Oh, really? It's past Larry's bedtime. Hello, brethren. Dutchy Duck is back with an update from my lodge, the Brogan Pla number 377. 
I recently had the privilege of meeting with some brethren from other lodges at a district school of instruction. Now, we don't often attend these types of events since we are always a little skeptical of outsiders trying to tell us how to do things. It must run in our Pennsylvania Dutch DNA. In any event, at the school I heard brethren telling stories about how many of their lodges had recently had heated debates and votes on making changes to their lodges. Some told about arguments breaking out on installing TVs in the lodge room to help with digital presentations. Some talked about how the trustees wouldn't agree to pay for bringing internet to their lodges. I heard some complaining about their past masters. They were holding their lodges back from progressing and moving into the 21st century. I just sat there and laughed at myself. For us at the Brogan Pla, our past masters are holding us back from moving into the 20th century. Yep, you heard me right. Earlier this year, there was a motion made on the floor to bring electricity to the temple. Now, if you remember from previous stories, our lodge is old school. We meet on the full moon. Our lodge room is lit by gas lights, and we have a potbelly stove in the northeast corner, which incidentally keeps me, the secretary, pretty toasty in the winter months. Uh, some of our younger members and officers were complaining that we need to get with the times. Well, at least the times if it was 1922. For decades, since our wally was electrified, our lodge refused to budge. Tradition, many shouted, as if they were all auditioning for the role of Tevya in our high school's production of Fiddler on the Roof. At our April meeting, it all came to a head. A group of younger brothers banded together and rose in unison, making a motion and seconding for bringing Thomas Edison's light juice to the temple. All at once, a loud sigh was heard from the bench full of past masters. The debate began. Back and forth, the two sides argued over the merits of their beliefs. Many brethren who hadn't taken a side just sat there flicking their heads back and forth as if they were watching an intense game of tennis. After 25 minutes of serious debate, Worshipful Master Amos Appleschnitz, a pro-electric brother, ended the debate. You have heard both sides, brethren, he announced. It's time to vote. One member said, let us use the ballot ball system so that we can vote in anonymity. Brother Appleschnitz allotted and the ballot box was placed on the altar. He announced, white balls equal electricity. Black balls keep us with gas. The brethren quickly lined up and voted in the fashion that we are all accustomed to. The vote was announced and it came back a tie. And we all looked around the room. There were 37 members present and all had voted. How could it be a tie? Brother Appleschnitz asked the brethren if anyone had not voted. No one said anything. Then Brother Jacob Blint rose and announced that he had picked up two balls since it was too dark for him to see which were white and which were black. The lodge erupted in laughter. Brother Appleschnitz asked Brother Blind that if he could have seen the balls, which one would he have picked? Brother Blind said, Well, Worshipful Master, I vote white for electricity. It's just too damn dark in here. So there you have it, brethren. Starting this week, the electric company will be paying a visit to the broken plot to bring us from darkness to true Masonic light. Till next time, work hard, stay plumb, and out in the lights when you leave the room. To learn more about the Pennsylvania Dutch language, culture, and history, please visit my website, padutch101.com, or my YouTube channel. Just search Doug Maidenford. In Masonic News Today, the Grand Lodge of Harrisburg has announced that owing to the skyrocketing cost of gasoline, local lodges should meet three times in one day, four times per year, thereby filling the requirement of quarterly meetings. Extra meetings will be held via Zoom, and banquets will be delivered by DoorDash to every member's home. It is believed that the cost savings should be nearly enough to cover the bar tab for one grotto ceremonial. That's the Masonic News. So what it was. <laughs> Those gas prices are rising, aren't they? <laughs> All right. Well, um, thanks, guys. We greatly appreciate you guys being with us tonight. Um, Jack, what have you got coming up in the next couple of weeks Masonically? 
I don't know. I'm thinking, <laughs> thinking <laughs> shrine petition. I, I said there's a shrine ceremonial <laughs> in Jesus, nine oh, days. Fuck. I bet I can get one for you no, here. <laughs> stop. No. I'll be a signer for you. Um, I don't know. Um, it's uh, yeah. If it if it keeps <laughs> keeps dripping on me, I'm gonna have to do it. Um, <laughs> No, What's I, your email address? I can send you one. Yes, yes. <laughs> Nunya Binnis at gmail.com. Gmail. Gmail. Um, <laughs> anyway, uh, no, I, I, um, I'm still working with candidates. I've got um, uh, a threshold meeting for a new guy who's joining an effort to lodge. Um, it's a great story. Uh, he's got nice. a friend You're who not joined. Go into it, are you? No, a great story for next show. Yeah, because uh, yeah, we've been here a long time. Uh, yeah. Okay, that's it. Good night. <laughs> <laughs> have a pleasant tomorrow. <laughs> Seth, how about you? I'll let uh, let the potentate talk about all the Zembo stuff. The only other thing on my schedule is an ACON executive committee meeting and a board of general purposes meeting where we will elect our next grand master. That so the whole, the, every really? two years we elect a grand master. So we have a nomination that's got to go before the board of general purposes. It's not public knowledge yet. So we have a couple of committee meetings to make that public uh, knowledge after it's approved by the board of general purposes. We have a new body chartering coming up. Too. That's correct. I, I will quickly... And I have to get him a check still. I will quickly make a plug <laughs> on on Wednesday, July 13th, because Wednesday uh, in the afternoon is the best date to get Masons out. We mm-hmm. will be uh, warranting Donegal Church Assemblage of the operatives. We will have the Grand Masters from England over here in Lancaster, sure to show them the best time of Pennsylvania Dutch Freemasonry can buy. Whoopie pies. Yeah, whoopie pies. And they will and be with us for, for two days and then flying to Texas, I think. But we're looking forward to hosting uh, them at the Lancaster Country Club and at the Lancaster Masonic Center and uh, warranting that and several people in this room are involved in that. So, Mike, Indeed. talk about Mike. Zembo. Yeah. I, I would be remiss if I didn't mention uh, June 11th. It's our, uh, I don't know, fourth annual Walk for Love. Uh, we take a hot lap around Italian Lake across Division Street from Zembo. Uh, we're looking for... Um, Donations. We're looking for walkers. We're looking for money because a hundred. I hear Larry likes to walk. It's funny. I've been, I've been in that exactly neighborhood. I've not, I have not met uh, another uh, Italian walking around there. A hundred percent of the proceeds go to the hospital in Philadelphia. Awesome. What exactly is a hot lap? Well, we walk quickly. Oh, okay. Briskly. <laughs> oh. And, and depending on the weather, it could be. It hot. could be really hot. Yeah. Yeah. A hot so, Italian lap. It's like salami. Right. Exactly. Wow. Ooh. <laughs> We're just going to move on. All those jokes yeah. go. Yeah, right Larry, now. quickly. Oh. What are you you walk quickly because you might be tailed. Goose and gridiron. No way. Every Thursday. Are you going tomorrow? Yes, I'm going tomorrow. All right. And uh, lodge meeting next week. Yes. And I'm sure Josh I have will no be there. idea what it's going to be like because nobody's going to be there. Well, it's going to be wise. interesting. <laughs> I think you're coming down. Well, Pete's doing I, it. I, I, I'm not sure. I this may, may be Masonic Light wait, Podcast Takeover. Not, I might be filling in as Worshipful Master, and I haven't been in the East since 2015. That's okay. It'll work. It hasn't changed. It may be MLP takeover night. It's supposed to be a picnic, but we found out tonight that it won't be a picnic. But I, I have no idea what the hell's going on. I just say we take advantage while we're in charge. Exactly. And we just pass all kinds of things and throw people out. And <laughs> <That's> <laughs> yeah, you, you know, that used to be the thing in DMLA. We told them when the kid, whatever kid showed up made the rules. So if three kids showed up and voted to have themselves a pizza party that night, that's what no. happened. It's a pizza party it's night. It's on. It's a win. <laughs> Pete. Um... Yeah, so uh, Lambertson Lodge, um, you know. Lamberton? Yes. No. Millersville Lodge. There it is. Lam- Lamberville. <laughs> Lamberville. You know, reunion season's over, so my schedule's <laughs> kind of uh, get, getting a little slower now for the summer. Um, just in time for doctor appointment season. Nice. So Woo! I've got a bunch of doctor's appointments coming up. Um, maybe I'll run into. It's all, what's always good about being the Masons, I always see another sick Mason in the waiting room. <laughs> Josh, what are you up to? Uh, just just lodge meeting, and uh, I'll be helping, maybe helping out with with you. Something. Doing something. <laughs> well, you can do the opening and closing charge, and I'll do everything else. It's supposed okay. to be a picnic. So you're, not, you're not having a picnic. It was like supposed business, to be a picnic when we were casual. asked. Sounds you're like not, a walk in the well, park all the way around. St- Everyone but the officers can still come in business casual, but the picnic is off. It's this coming up later. This is just totally wrong. It's get over it. <laughs> Don't we have chickens or something to cut to? <laughs> Not yet. Chickens. Um, so I've got uh, a few things coming up. Actually, oh, we figured that. Oh. Well, actually, next week is really nice. I don't have anything planned, which is great. All right, hush. 
I do uh, need to get a larger research audit done, so we could probably. Fit I was going to say, Seth, we need to talk afterwards. We got to get some <laughs> audits done here. Um, I may or may not be part of some significant role at um, <laughs> Lamberville uh, Lodge, um, Millersville Lodge. Uh, we'll see, but that's on the seventh. The night before, Eureka West Shore Lodge number three hundred and two is having their annual strawberry night. But more significantly, prior to that, uh, we're having a pig roast. Uh, starting at 5.30. Uh, it's a family night. Uh, everyone's invited, but you have to uh, get a reservation in just to let us know. These, so have, know. these pigs have no affiliation with the stunt pigs from Zemba. That is correct. <laughs> Let's make They're actually guinea pigs. Clear. Those pigs are still on tour. Um, sadly, I won't be able to do hot laps around the Italian lake because the 11th of June is also the Grand Lodge quarterly communication that it is. in Johnstown. Uh, You'll be doing a hot lap in Johnstown. Exactly. It's also, put a plug in for this, Shrewsbury Lodge uh, is having their annual car show that same day. Uh, So if you're in southern Pennsylvania along I-83, just when you get to the Maryland border, stop, get out, and it's off to your right. Um, That'll be a great opportunity uh, for all. And that's what i got coming up in the next couple of weeks. All right. Well, great episode, guys. Um, Thanks for having us. It's time to cue the chickens. And uh, Larry, get us out of here. Hey, uh, special thanks to uh, Effort Lodge 665 for Forgot where we were, didn't you? providing this beautiful studio in the basement. And uh, special thanks to Josh, uh, yeah, Josh Lamberton. Lamberville. I almost said your right name, Lamberville. <laughs> Josh Lamberville. Uh, for continuing to make this show really great. And let me let me tell you, folks, we talked about this tonight. He he does. A phenomenal job. You're here. Yeah, amen on that one. Also, thanks to Jack Harley, our news director, and Tim, Timmy, Tim, what the hell? <laughs> Demet, Demet. Yeah, that's Demet. me. Yes, yeah. I'm sorry. I had one of those senior moments uh, for our marketing director, Michelle Snyder, Doug Maddenford, and uh, oh god, who's the guy from Pittsburgh again? Oh come on, oh, Jeff, his, his Jeff, name's not up there. Jeff Wonderling? No. No. Uh, Shivering. Shivering. Yeah. By the way, he had some good art. Good art. Yeah, good, yeah, good, good. Yeah, absolutely, absolutely. absolutely. Yep. And uh, those are our uh, Masonic Light contributors. Yeah, we <laughs> used to have more, but now we have good ones. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So I want to close with one thing. I had a friend, a state trooper, and I told you about this one oh, before. Gosh. Yeah. Oh, he, oh God. He was he was following this car that was driving kind of erratically, and he pulled him over. Erratically. And this this woman, she's a senior citizen. He, the, the officer says, can I see your driver's license? She looks over to her husband. What did he say? Her husband said, wants to see your license. So she handed him the license, and the patrolman, the officer, is looking at this. He says, oh, I see you're from Arkansas. He said, I once went on a blind date with a woman from Arkansas. She was the ugliest woman I've ever met. The wife looks over to the husband and says, what did he say? The husband says, he said he knows you. <laughs> oh, no. We apologize to our listeners in Arkansas. Oh, my God. I'm telling you, I'm done telling these stories. Uh, I'll explain the difference. We love you, Larry. (laughs) Troopers and officers. Uh, It's Larry Mara saying thank you for listening wherever you are in the world or what planet you're on. (laughs) Good night, everybody. Bye, everybody.